Everybody ready? Yeah. Everybody probably already knows where we're going to be, so let's go ahead and turn to Genesis. Oh, is that where we're going? We're going to Genesis, <laughs> chapter 1. Come on. Yeah. Genesis. We're starting at the beginning. I know. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's, let's read these first couple of verses. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. The Bible says this. It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit, capital S, the Spirit of God, moved upon the face of the waters. So we're going to stop right there. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And I believe it's important to stop here for several reasons. One, because as we get ready to enter this brand new journey, I want to show you how in depth we're going to be able to go. We read these verses and we always think of the creation account. And we just look at its creation in the beginning. God created. And, and so it has become so cliche, but there's actually meat that is found in just these couple of verses. So um, outside of Psalms, it's probably the most read verses out of, the, out of the Old Testament. And of course, the commandments used to be the most read until they started taking them down all over all the public institutions. So, but in the beginning, I mean, even movies and shows that make fun of it will even mockingly quote these scriptures. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I want us to do a backdrop of Genesis itself, give you an idea of what's actually behind the book of Genesis, and then we'll go ahead and we'll dig into these verses. Are y'all ready? Yeah. All right, so the book of, of Genesis, if you're taking notes and you're wanting to know the authorship, the book of Genesis was written by Moses. Mm -hmm. Now, if you understand timelines and you don't understand how he wrote it and why he wrote it, that probably doesn't make sense because he wasn't there at the beginning. So what's he doing writing it, right? So we're, we're going we're gonna to break all of this down. But most believe, though, that it was written by Moses. Some try to say that uh, it, it was a collection of writers that had written the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. Most of us adhere to the belief that Moses had written them. There's just there's so much overwhelming evidence beyond the Bible itself that, that proves that. Even Jesus, in John chapter 5, verses 46 and 47, speaks of Moses' writings. And so from even that point, the Jewish community and, and early church fathers, even from that era, adhered to that belief that the first five books were written by Moses, okay? So, so the date of the writing. And, and there's a reason to understand all this here in just a moment because we're going to set the setting and the scene for when it was written. But the, the date of the writing uh, goes back to the 15th century B.C. So you're looking at 1,500 plus years before Jesus comes on the scene, before he's born of a virgin birth. These words <coughs> were, were penned. Now, you have to understand there's been, at this point, there's been at least 4,500 years since the account, at least. And I say at least because we don't know how long Adam was in the garden with the Lord before Eve comes along as the helpmate and before eventually the fall. We don't know. Um, some people have old earth dating mentalities and they believe that we've been around for millions of years. Some believe thousands of years. It doesn't matter. Time as we know it, and lifespans as we know it started at the fall of man. Mm -hmm. And we date that back to about 6,000 B.C. Okay, so is everybody with me so far? Yes, sir. Okay, so, all right. So the original language that Genesis were, was written in was the pure language form of Hebrew. Now, they've been restoring the original pure Hebrew language that supposedly was lost until just the last couple of centuries. So it's actually, it's a prophetic word of how that the language would be restored in latter times. So we've actually seen that prophecy happening in the original <coughs> writings of Genesis was in the pure language form of Hebrew, okay? Um, because of this, if you do your studies and you, and, and you understand Jewish customs and, and the way that writings were, especially with the inspiration of the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost, um, Hebrew is, is a sacred type of language that often there's there's words and numbers that have additional meanings and, and greater depth and a lot of symbolism that is used. And I'm just giving you a backdrop on this for a reason because I'm going to start breaking this down for you in these first couple of verses here in a minute. Um, so you got a time where uh, when this was being written, the world was full of folklore. Uh, because of things that had taken place, such as the flood, uh, a lot of people will say the Bible stole the flood from other writings and, and other folklore and plagiarized that and added it, but that's not the case. If you do your studies on history, you'll find that 
in the midst of all the folklore, they were pushing polytheism. Mm -hmm. So like the act of creation was actually an act of hatred that was done by multiple gods. The act of the flood was because this god was fighting this god and they got mad at, 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 at different ones that got him. And there's a lot of crazy stuff that's, that's told out there and they use words and, and names and locations that don't even exist. And so none of those fables have ever held up over time. And I, I'm telling you that for a reason because I'm getting ready to give you one of the examples of some folklore about the flood. Because, for example, if you go out here, all right, on the way to church, you know where Victory Tabernacle's at. Right off of that road, there was a wreck. I wasn't there. I don't know how it happened. I don't know how serious it was. But now I come to you and I tell you all. Now, if you all leave here, you all could say, well, I think somebody was drinking tonight and they had a wreck. Uh -huh. Well, then this one over here goes and says, you know, drugs and alcohol are so bad over in that area, I believe that they probably was taking pills or something. Mm -hmm. And then over here, it gets spread. And now they're saying, well, there was a fight between a husband and a wife. And the wife left the husband and sped out and, and wasn't paying attention oh, and yeah. hit somebody head on. So before you know it, you've got one true account, but you've got all kinds of people uh -huh. telling different variations of it. But only one has the substantial evidence of what the truth is, and that's those who were there who had an eye account right. of what was going on. So God gives word to Moses about creation, and he gives him information that there's no way he could have known if it wasn't for God revealing it to right. him that thousands of years would be found out to be true. Right. right. And we'll get into that here in a little bit as well. So just want you to understand that because Genesis is kind of, um, I, if you've ever seen like a, the manifest or a manifesto, um, it gives you the complete details of, of what's contained within. Like, for example, if you have an airplane manifest, that's everybody that's on it. It's supposed to have inventory of all the stuff that's on it as well. So Genesis is kind of a theological manifesto. Uh, it gives us a monotheistic understanding of God. In the midst of the time where everybody believed in multiple gods, you have this one talking about the one true God. And so it stood the test of time. It's prevailed against false beliefs of polytheism from those days of antiquity. Genesis establishes truth regarding, and again, I'm just giving you just a, a backdrop on Genesis, but establishes truth regarding the sovereign creator God. It sets the stage for the unfolding narrative of the Israelite people and even their covenant relationship with God. Genesis actually addresses questions such as, who are we? Where do we come from? What is our relationship with the Creator and with creation? So even though Genesis is, a, is, is an ancient text, it's alive. And it's filled with truth and even hope for today. It's the beginning of God's revelation, a revelation that culminates in the person of Christ Jesus. Y'all following me so far? Again, I just want you to understand, the, because every time we hear the word Genesis, we think of beginning. And because of that, we just think that's all it relates to is creation. Some people that know what's in Genesis will quickly go to Sodom and Gomorrah or Noah and the Ark. But we miss so much about Genesis from start to finish. So the theological themes of creation, the fall, covenants, redemption echoes all throughout this book, just as it does all throughout the entire Bible. Genesis sets the stage for it all. Mm -hmm. And of course we find the fulfillment thereof in the New Testament. So. Uh, some a little bit of archaeological insight as it relates to the authenticity of Genesis because most atheists, that's why there's been such a push to give answers out of Genesis because most atheists try to use the book of Genesis to denounce the authenticity of God. They will use Genesis and they'll use accounts that's found in Genesis to try to say, well, God doesn't exist. And of course, then you have those who's really got the axe to grind and they'll move over into the time of the law and say, well, if God is a good God, then why is he doing this? Why is he murdering? Why is he, you know? So these are two of the, the foundations that atheism is really found on and populated with. But the authenticity of Genesis and its connection to actual history has been a subject of ongoing discovery What's, what's awesome about it is this ancient city that Abraham was from has actually been discovered. Mm -hmm. So people used to say, oh, all these names and all these cities and all this stuff back in the Old Testament mm -hmm. didn't even exist because there was no proof of it. But then in just the last couple of hundred years, they've been finding stuff left and right. Mm -hmm. And they, they had discovered this city of Ur. You are. You are. For your texting folks. Anyway. Um, also, there's tablets that was found that dates back to the 15th century B.C. that gave the customs and gave legal practices of the time. And so you find a lot of the societal norms that are depicted in Genesis and how <laughs> things were handled 
you find in those tablets. So, I mean, there's even a correlation with that that had stood the test of time. You have the Ebla tablets that were found in Syria, and they dated back to 2500 B.C., and it mentions names and places such as Sodom and Gomorrah that aligns with the geographical and the cultural settings that's found in, in Genesis. People thought, oh, well, Sodom and Gomorrah didn't really exist. This was just a metaphor. This is symbolism because, you know, God will burn up what isn't of him. No, these were literal places that existed, and you have something that is non-biblical that proves that that was written those centuries later. So, what is the name of the tablet? Ebla tablets. I was... Uh... <laughs> I was listening uh, yeah. things like a video maybe on YouTube or just I can't remember <coughs> for sure now but it was just a few days ago and they was talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, him, the guy might have been a scientist but anyway he said that there is hailstones brimstone mm -hmm. right in that place even today said it's not hard to find and he said that it's not like this anywhere else in the world he said, you can dig a little bit, and he says, right there they are. I mean, it's, it's evident. See, it's powerful because stuff that people used to say didn't exist, yeah. they keep finding. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. So, so Genesis, where people try to tie it in with the folklore uh, that was found over in, in what they call Near Eastern area, <laughs> um, the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh is what everybody tries to say the flood came from. And there is a narrative there. They tried to explain why a flood came and what happened, but they use myth. So it's like taking a real situation or a real story, a real account, and then turning it into a movie and, and making it something of your own. That's what they did. They mm -hmm. took an account and they began to write mythical elements behind it. Uh, so if you, if you read or you, if you've heard the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh, you'll find that there's many, many differences. For example, uh, when it comes to the Word of God, the Word of God reveals to us the monotheistic God and why things happen, how they happen, and then proof and locations of where things happen. When you take the, uh, the account that's uh, found with the Sumerian Flood of Gilgamesh or the Epic of Gilgamesh, then you find all the mythical embellishments they, they use a historical setting, but then they begin to give false names, they have false gods, they have false locations, false cities to tell of this mythic hero king Gilgamesh. And so they begin to tell a story that didn't exist using an account that did happen. So um, Genesis presents the flood as a response to human wickedness. It highlights the theme of judgment, mercy, grace, covenant, and even redemption that would come. Uh, with the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's just an act of gods that lacked any kind of, of moral depth. So uh, it was almost like a mockery or a parody of real history. So that's why we know that the flood, as given an account in the Bible, has not been something drawn from something that wasn't real or something else that was going on because it stood the test of time. That's why they still keep finding things that continues to prove things in the book of Genesis all these dozens of centuries later. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. So the numeric patterns that's found in Genesis, you'll find is, is it's actually it's really cool, um, which we was talking about numbers the other night, but the word God appears 35 times, five times seven. The word earth appears 21 times, three times seven. And then heaven slash firmament, 21 times, which is three times seven. So if you look at the number seven, we know that it represents perfection or completion. <clears throat> And it's a recurring theme that's found all throughout Genesis. Beyond the obvious seven days where he, we have the six days of creation and the day of rest to give a full week, the word God or Elohim in Hebrew is, is mentioned those times, which gives us the, um, through, or the five and the seven, which we know five represents grace. Seven represents perfection or completion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have the three and the seven, the completeness of God's creation. So... Something else that maybe has been overlooked is if you look at the first three days of creation, the first three days are the formation of environments. It's where you have the differences of the lightness and, and the light and the darkness, the sky and the water, land and vegetation. The next three days actually involves the filling of those environments. It's where you have the sun, the moon, the stars, the bird, the fish, the land, the animals, and the humans. So it just shows harmony and it shows an order to creation. Um, one thing I do want to throw out 
when, and I know we sing that song, he's still working on me. And, and we've always taught that it's a full seven days, six days of work and a day of rest. But if you take the actual word that's used here for day, the word is yom, and it can actually represent an era or an undefined period. So um, even those days in God's time, because he, he's not constrained by time, could have been, yeah, could have been a thousand years. Genesis is structured around the phrase, these are the generations of. That, that statement is used 10 times, and each section begins to unfold God's plan from creation to the calling of Israel. The name Genesis means origin or beginning, kind of capture the essence of the book, the beginning of the world, humanity, sin, God's plan of redemption. Of course, Methuselah's age, he was the oldest person according to the Bible, living 969 years. Mandy, you almost got him. <laughs> Bird. 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 Yeah. His death coincides with the year of the flood, according to biblical chronology. So that shows us an end of that era with his passing, which we know he was shortened men's days on this earth after that. What's really cool is the genealogies of the names that's found in Genesis. Each name has a meaning, and if you take them and you read them, they actually tell the story. Y'all want to hear it? That's why yeah. I sent you that TikTok. Did you watch it? I didn't. No. I wanted to know if that was true because I didn't have time to go in there and look is it, it Is it about Adam, Seth, and not? Yeah. Really? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I, I didn't watch it, no. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Tina. Okay. I just snuck in a modern name there. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Mahalel? No, if you want a modern name, here you go. Jared? <laughs> Enoch? Uh-huh. Methuselah? Lamech? And Noah? <laughs> Them parents did not love their children. <laughs> no, but 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 listen to this though. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> but listen to the sentence that comes for this. Man, Adam, man is appointed, mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. Better repeat that one. Sure. Man is appointed, mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. Also, the opening verse here, because we're getting ready to dig into these first two verses now. The opening verse says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Realize that's seven Hebrew words, which further emphasizes the theme of completeness. The very start, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right, so let's break this first verse down. Y'all ready? Y'all ready or y'all yeah. 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 bored? Am I getting too narrow for you? <laughs> no, I should have told you, right? All right. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> I won't try to read it in Hebrew. So, um, Come on. But that first, that first phrase, in the beginning, that comes from the word, well, the phrase, bereshit. You gotta be careful on how you say this too. I'll tell you. Bereshit. Bereshit. Uh, all right. You want me to spell it for you? Okay. B e r e s h i t. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I said, be careful how you pronounce it, y'all. In the beginning, yes. So. <laughs> It's not just the start of time, but it's, it's actually the origin of God's purposeful actions as it relates to the universe, this world, all of humanity, me and you, right? It contains the same letters as bara sheet, which is a phrase that means created six, bara sheet. So it's kind of a dual way to imply six days of creation that follows. Okay, so this is in the beginning, in the beginning, this means... When we pick up in this narrative, this is the start of everything that we are to know from that point forward. If you take it in Hebrew, God and created will actually be flipped, so we're going to look at created. So the word created comes from the word bara, B-A-R-A. It's not the same as the word for making. The word making comes from the Hebrew, which you don't need to write this down, but it comes from the Hebrew Asa. But bara is used for divine <laughs> creation because this literally means to create something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. We're not using materials to create something else. We're not, we're not, you know what I'm saying? 
Like, it's not a person that has emotions and is able to make themselves angry, happy, sad, mad, glad. This is literally taking nothing and forming something out of nothing, um, which is creation ex nihilio. Didn't you teach something similar in the offering? I did. Yeah. Yep, because authoring is what Satan did with sin mm -hmm. in the heavens. <clears throat> to literally create means that there was no prior existence in any form. Okay? All right. Elohim which we're not going to stay here long because we're going to be hitting that word later on <laughs> when we hit the names of God. And we're probably going to break a lot of religious bubbles when we do. But Elohim means God. It's a plural noun that's used with a singular verb, which doesn't make sense to most people. If you were to ask an English person, be like, how can you have plural and singular at the same time? They're going to be like, <gasps> mind blown. But it shows us the complexity of God, and you just can't wrap your mind around him. But the word Elohim, that's God above us. That's the majesty, the power, uh, the one who transcends human understanding. Um, the heavens, the earth. So when you take the heavens and the earth, if, if, I were to, if I were to say I lost my wallet here at church, okay? God forbid. Say I lost my wallet here at church, and I'm asking you all to help me look if I can't find it, if I don't get a chance to check. So Sunday we come in here and you come up to me and you say, hey, did you look for your wallet? And I look at you and I say, I looked high and low. For me to say it, I looked high and low means that I looked everywhere. everywhere. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this phrase, the heavens <coughs> and the earth, it, that's called mirrorism. Mm -hmm. You take two contrasting things that are on extreme opposite sides, and you use them to describe that it's everything in between. So when it says, it doesn't say, it. okay, so in the Bible, when you read about the heavens and the earth, it doesn't say all the universe, but it does, because that's exactly what that means. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You got to understand authorship and what those phrases mean. So the contrasting parts, I looked high and low. I looked everywhere, in other, word, in other words. So the heavens and the earth, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. Everything. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The whole thing. All right. So we can go back and we can say, in the beginning. That's the phrase that sets the stage for time and existence because he's outside of the time-space continuum. Right. He's in eternity. Right? But this is the <laughs> phrase that sets the stage for it all. It's the starting point for everything that exists. Then we go, God. That gives us the clear identity of the divine, majestic being that is full of power. The God above us, mm -hmm. created, that means created out of nothing, made something where there was nothing, mm -hmm. right? right. Mm -hmm. The heavens and the earth, and again, the totality of creation and everything within, the spiritual and the physical realms. If it's in existence, it's because he created it. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to give you some scriptural correlations and, and kind of give you an expansive look on just this first verse and how it ties in all throughout the word. Y'all ready? In John 1, Come on with it. verses 1 through 3, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word. Yeah. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. Right. Now, we're not going to break down John 1, 1 through 3 right now until we get to it, right. but we see the correlation. The Word in creation. God, the creator, echoing the theme of the beginning, emphasizing how the Lord himself was central and the one that was involved in all creation. Make sense? Yes. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. So anybody that says, oh, that's just an old mm -hmm. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. This identifies the Lord himself as the sole agent of creation, showing us that everything was created with purpose and intention. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11.3 shows us the faith and the understanding of creation. The Bible says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, the Word, mm -hmm. so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Psalms 33, 6, and 9 is the power of God's word in creation. The Bible says this, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Psalm 33, 6, and 9. The word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Mm -hmm. 
So we find the very power of God's word, the spoken word in creation, which resonates again with his, his authoritative act of creation right here in the very first verse of Genesis. Revelations 4.11, the Bible says this, says, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, mm -hmm. and by your will they were created and have their being. <laughs> so we find here, again, we can worship God because we were created for a purpose and for a reason, and all things were created by him. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 42.5 shows us God is creator of heaven and earth. Isaiah 42.5 says this, this is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it, showing us that God was involved in creation. You matter to him. You, you were created with a purpose. Even if a parent has a child on accident, it, there's no accident to that life. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to give you several more scriptures. I'm not going to read them, and I'm going to give you several more scriptures. So <laughs> get ready. <laughs> Proverbs 8:22 through 31. Proverbs 8:22 through 31 gives us even wisdom's role in the creation process. It begins to echo Genesis 1:1's theme of creation. Uh, Nehemiah 9:6. There's a reinforcement here of God being the sustainer of creation, and He's the one that sustains life. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 12 and 13 shows us God's power in creation as it reveals him with power, wisdom, and understanding. And then, of course, Psalm 104 shows us God's role in sustaining his creation. Isaiah 45, 18 again reiterates that there is purpose in creation, so it's not a random act, right? But one with intention. Romans 1, 20 gives us God's nature revealed mm -hmm. in creation because... We're a reflection of the Creator. So that is kind of scary, isn't it? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5. We find here in Second Peter 3 and 5, the earth was formed out of the water. It gives us the understanding and it kind of complements here in Genesis where there's a role of the water and the word and the formation of the earth. And if you're wanting other scriptures that goes with Genesis 1-1, I'm going to give you a, a quick gun down on them. So there's, there's two locations in Exodus, and you can check them out and check out the connections for yourself and what it says to you. But Exodus 20, 11, uh, 31, 17. 2 Kings, I don't know, it's probably about 30, 35 hours behind this, in case y'all can't tell. <laughs> wow. 2 Kings 19, 15. 1 Chronicles, we're going to be doing 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, and Nehemiah. Y'all want to go ahead and write those names down. The 1 Chronicles... Chapter 16, verse 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 12. And the reason why I'm giving you all these scriptures is because as you read through them, if they speak to you, then whatever you journal and you keep your notes in or whatever you're going to be writing to correlate with these Bible studies to where you can look back at Genesis 1-1 and say, I need this as a reminder, you can write that in there, the ones that really stick out to you the most. Nehemiah 9-6 i got four places for you in Job, and then we'll hit Psalms. Job 9, 8, and then chapter 26, there's two different verses. It's verse 7 and verse 13. 26, 7, and 13. And then chapter 38, verses 4 through 7. Psalms. I'm going to hit these a little bit quick because we've got to get to the next verse. Psalms 8, 3, 19, 1, 33. Verses 6 and 9, chapter 89, verse 11. Chapter 90, verse 2. Chapter 96, verse 5. 102, 25. Of course, 104, I already said earlier. 115, 15. I wrote a lot of songs about the creativity of God. Uh huh. A lot to worship God for. 121, 2. 124, 8. 134, 3. 136, 5. 146, 6. In 148, 4, and 5. So some points behind just this very first verse. For those of y'all that's wanting some commentary or some things that might help out a little bit. Knowledge and understanding. Uh, God's sovereignty is established from the universe's very beginning. And I do have, I do have scripture references for these, but I don't know if you want them or not. Our, exi <laughs> our existence is found in, in purpose, not just by accident or chance. 
With God's ability to create something out of nothing, that assures us of his capability to meet our needs. Yes. You know, when we, when we read out of Philippians 4.19, mm -hmm. we can remember Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. If he can create something out of nothing, he can meet a need. He can pay a bill. He can heal my body. <laughs> Genesis 1.1 1, 1 offers comfort that God has always been and always will be in control. So when you think of in the beginning, here's, here's your profound truth to remember. Before the mountains were formed, before the oceans begin to flow, there was God. He exists outside of time. He's unbound by physical laws that govern our universe. This God, the only true God, our God, he's not just some distant architect Come that's on. left us to our own demise. He's intimately involved, and he's crafted creation with a purpose and a plan. He didn't rearrange pre-existing materials, but he's the originator of all matter, of all life, and the essence of everything that is. So why did God create? Why? Anybody want to take a stab at that? To worship him. Why did God create? To, to show an expression of his love because he's so loving that he wanted to um, show himself. Show his love. You had to give. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? Just all together creation or like man? Yeah. All together creation. I was going to say man, just not exactly companionship, but to have a relationship. Because where we were talked before, you know, the angels, mm -hmm. they don't have free will. Right. right. But we do. Well, thank you. Anybody else want to add to that? Why did God create? Hmm? Well, uh, Scripture yep. said that everything that, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No. Scripture said that everything God created, he said it was good. Yeah. So he he has bragging rights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. 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 Anybody else want to add to that? So he has a physical habitation. No, that's not good enough. <laughs> I'm, just, this, the, I'm just giving y'all kind of an open floor if anybody wants to. Oh, that scripture, everything that has breath that praise, it says praise you the Lord. Yeah. Uh, the trees, uh, birds, the grass, everything that breathes in creation praises the Lord. And uh, it's, it's because of, uh, something about the substance. Uh, I'm not... Not that smart. That's why we're here. We were created for him. <laughs> are you like giving us an answer or you're just waiting to see? I'm, I'm, letting, I'm letting you all kind of talk here for a minute. We were yeah. created by him and for him. Yeah. That's, that's a little bit of a start. Yeah. And now we're in him. So, so we could say that we find our identity and our purpose. <coughs> so, so when he created, he created with a purpose and a plan. To have, as she said, relationship, yeah. right? To have fellowship. fellowship, okay? So that means we're not accidents of nature. That's right. You didn't come from a blob of goo. <laughs> you didn't come from a, some kind of cell soup, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, some act like a big pile of goo sometimes. But, but we are intentional creations of a God who loves us, who has a plan for us, who called us to live in relationship with him. <laughs> So in the beginning, God, yeah. before your problems, before your struggles, before your pain, there was God and there is God. He always was the Alpha and he will always be the Omega. That makes sense? Amen. Amen. Before time began, God existed. He's the unchanging anchor in our ever-changing world. That's God's eternal nature. Amen. For God's sovereignty and the act of creation, God demonstrated his absolute authority over all that exists. Amen? Amen. Amen. So belief in God as creator lays the foundation for understanding his nature and our relationship with him. The creation of heaven and earth showcases his limitless power and ability to bring forth life from nothing. The divine order that's given, the orderliness thereof, of creation reflects God's nature as a God of order, not chaos. Amen. Come on. All right? Amen. So therefore, the God who created the heavens and the earth is the same God who offers us hope and redemption. Oh, that's just from your very first verse out of your Bible. So let's move to verse 2. We're doing great. Hey, we got all year. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, we may have to just have a revival of Bible study. Anyway, revival study. All right. <laughs> verse 2. 
The earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Just turn and the Spirit of God, God's going to turn a lot of people's pages oh, on this on. season. Yeah. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So, the earth was without form and void. Yeah. I'm not going to, well, I'm going to try to say it. I'm not speaking in tongues, but it's <laughs> tohu va vohu. <laughs> Let me try that one more time. Okay. Tohu va vohu. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so, so to take this phrase, the earth was without form and void, to be formless is tohu. That means chaos or emptiness, darkness, right? That's, that's a state of being unformed or unfilled. So think of it like this. Y'all ready? Ready. Think of Bob Ross. Oh, Hold on! Follow me! What? Follow me! Bob Ross! Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? From PBS that always painted those happy little trees. You know what I'm talking about? He's a painter, he's an artist. I should have brought up Bob Ross a lot sooner. Yeah, he's got a cool afro. Right, right. Came dressed as Bob Ross one year. I was like, look at this. I'm famous. I got a picture with Bob Ross. But check this out. Check this out. At the beginning of the show, before he ever starts, you have a blank canvas. That's exactly what the world was. And God, Bob Ross, in this example, would be as God. Painting his happy little trees. Yep. Right. <laughs> And there's nothing, nothing's ever a mistake. It's always a happy little tree. There you go. There you go. All the trees in the field clap your hands. I'll be back on that tree again. Come on with it. As long as ain't no cows, we're good. All right. the cows You had to say that, didn't you? So the word void, the, the word void, it comes from bohu, or in some, in some translations, bohu. And it reinforces the idea of an, of an emptiness or an absence, a state of barrenness. So together, it's, it means a world that's not yet shaped or inhabited. Yeah. So darkness was up on the face of the deep would be next. Darkness, that's, that comes from the word choshek, which not to be confused with toshak. Oh, and that's God. when you hit your toe up against something, you know. It's like they say, man, when Pastor Jay preaches, he steps on my toes. I try not to step on your toes because y'all be breaking them between services. But anyway, anyway. So, but the Hebrew word here, huh? T O H U, tohu. Darkness is choshak, which means an absence of light. It's it's the unknown or the unseen. C H O. I love it. I'm telling the truth, sissy. S H E K. What I do? So the darkness, that 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 unknown or that unseen, it, it covers the deep, which is T home, T E H O M. I'm trying to help y'all out. The the deep literally means chaotic waters, mm -hmm. an untamed force of nature. But guess what? An untamed force of nature has no power over the God of all control. Amen. Amen. The deep. You think of those chaotic waters and how God was able to take something that was unstructured and mm -hmm. untamed and be able to use it and move upon it. Because that's what the next next phrase says. The spirit, <coughs> the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Which we broke this down during sitting shares, so I'm not going to stay here long. But the spirit of God, Ruach. Elohim. That means the wind, the breath, the spirit, this moving over the waters. This is God. For one, he's bringing, again, order out of chaos. Two, he's taming the untamable. Three, he's controlling the uncontrollable. Four, he's also showing a, a nurturing or a comforting action. So he's transforming this formlessness into a structured, habitable world. It symbolizes how the Spirit of God or the breath of the wind of God is able to move upon something and, and make something ready for life where once all there was was death or darkness or emptiness. 
some scriptures that correlate with Genesis 1-2. Job 26-7. And that scripture says this. While y'all are writing Job 26-7, I'm gonna, I'll read it to you. It says, He stretches out the north over the void. He hangs the earth on nothing. Yep. Come on, huh? <laughs> Come on. Come on. That's right. Think about that concept. Taking something that was void and formless and, and something that was full of chaos and disorder and death and darkness and he's able to bring life out of it and then he takes it and his power is able to shape the universe and shape everything within it. Mm -hmm. mm. Psalm 104.30, which I think y'all got 104 written down for the first verse as well. But you send forth your spirit, they are created. You renew the face of the ground. This is the sim similarity here is to the spirit of God moving, speaking that life-giving and that renewing power of God's spirit in creation. Proverbs 8.27 speaks about establishing the heavens and how I was there. He said, when I set a compass upon the face of the depth. In other words, wisdom was present at the time of creation. Isaiah 45 says, in verse 18, sorry, Thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it, He established it, did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. Showing us that He took something that was a waste place and turned it into something that was habitable. Moving it from that formlessness, that void, into a place of order for life. Jeremiah 4:23. the Bible says this, I looked on the earth and behold, it was formless and void into the heavens, and they had no light. So we, again, we find the earth being desolate again, being void and formless, and how that chaotic state, how it was before God moved. And again, y'all should have Revelation 4 already written down as well. But that's where John says, I was immediately in the spirit, and the throne was in heaven, and there was the one sitting on the throne, which shows us even the moving of the spirit of God found here in Genesis and how there's divine revelation and ongoing work of God, even in the cosmos, so to speak, or the celestial. I've got a ton more scriptures that, that connect to this verse. <laughs> so we have, the earth was without form and void. So again, to kind of summarize here, that signifies the chaos, the emptiness, the lack of order. This also represents life's chaotic moments. The time when everything seems formless or seems aimless or seems empty. But it's in those moments of chaos, those moments of uncertainty, that God can still do such great, amazing, and magnificent work and bring peace in the midst of, of storms or turmoil and make sense out of something that makes absolutely no sense to us. Right. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Darkness here isn't just physical, but it also speaks to us in the form of a metaphor for the times in our lives when we are dealing with darkness or uncertainty, things that's going on that seems like it's bringing despair or even trying to cause us to feel hopeless, we can remember yeah. darkness is never ever a barrier to God. Instead, it is actually a divine moment of opportunity for God to bring forth light. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Even when all seems void and seems without a form, the Spirit of God will be right there. He hovers, He moves, he comforts, and then he prepares us for that transformation that we need. Does that make sense? So to kind of bring it to a point here, in your chaos, God's preparing yet something great for you, something that he's going to get glory and you're going to get the victory. Because we go through many things, but if you realize we have many testimonies, times where it didn't seem like we'd be able to make it through. Uh -huh. It seemed like it was formless, it was void, there was darkness, but then God shows up on the scene. And then he makes a way where there seems to be no way. We don't just sing the songs, but we live them. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. God transformed the formless earth. He can transform your chaotic situations and circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so I can throw this out there, not to be too cliche, but your confusion is not your conclusion. Amen. That's a good one, ain't it? But, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> God's presence in the dark. When darkness looms, remember the Spirit of God is still moving. Even in your darkest hour, God's closer than you think. And He is working things out for our good. Amen. From void, let's contrast that. From void to victory. Your emptiness, and what seems to be your emptiness or your hopelessness, is God's opportunity. Where you see lack, that gives God the open door to creatively show up 
and provide. Where there seemed to be no way, he knows how to make the way. Amen. No situation is too void for God's intervention. He specializes in turning nothing into something. Amen. He knows how to take your despair, pull it out, and instead give you hope. <clears throat> Just as Genesis marks a beginning, God can start something new in your life. It's never too late for a new beginning in God. Amen? Amen. Last, last point, last thought before I give you just some, some quotes for that verse. There's hope in the hovering. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> There's hope in the hovering. Because even when you do not feel it, God's Spirit is still moving in your He's life. Still, He's yeah. still preparing. He's still shaping. He's still making a way even for your breakthrough when it feels like you're at your breaking point. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Is that all right? Yes. All right. Just some... some uh, Quotes or statements or whatever you want to call it in case you want to jot anything down. From the void, God knows how to birth victory and purpose. In uncertainty, always trust God. He designed the universe. He can surely take care of you. Your confusion is not the end. It's just the beginning of God's revelation. Your life's deep waters are where God's wonders unfold. Even those formless phases and seasons that you go through prepares the way for God's beautiful design because he's still in control. And I'll just leave you at that for now, I guess. Amen. We made it through two verses, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> That's a new stuff right there. Woo! I love it. That's what I said. We're eating and drinking. I wrote it. I like it.